Alright ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to class. Uh, I am sure that everybody is sitting in their room and enjoying their life, so, um, you know, kudos to you. We're going to finish up physical, physical oceanography today with, um, with the lecture here. You may not be able to see my face, but you can hear my voice. And if it's annoying, I'm sorry. And if it's not, you know, here we are, we're doing well. Alright, so let's talk about upwelling. This will be the third time that Cambridge mentions upwelling um, within the course. So clearly upwelling is an important concept for them. So make sure you know this definition. That is the movement of cold, nutrient-rich water from the seabed to the ocean surface, usually caused by wind and the shape of the seabed. So if you take a look at the picture here, <clears throat> wind as you see represented here and here, will actually push the surface water away from either the shore or from, let's say if it's out in the open ocean, kind of anywhere that um, it can move the uh, water. Uh, we learned that with the currents, um, you know, the wind is the big driving force for moving the water. Uh, you saw that in the videos, um, specifically with the, on the Nazare plate in Portugal. Um, Wind is a really big driving factor for the water, and it's a very strong driving factor for the water. So as it pushes a surface layer of the water away, it gives an opportunity for the water that is below it to rise up. And that is critical for um, the uh, development of marine life, um, for fisheries and things like that, all right? And so um, that is what is written here. <clears throat> so again, your wind over the water will force that warm surface water away from the coastline normally. So if we're in the southern hemisphere specifically, it's going to push west. Um, and where we look at it most or examine it most, we being Cambridge, um, it's off of the coast of South America. And that's where we see El Nino events happen. Um, and so you're upwelling in uh, in this chapter is a precursor to um, El Nino, and we're going to get into it uh, just after this, this slide and the next slide, all right? Um, but in, in any case, the wind is going to move the water, this, the warm surface water, away from the coastline, and that's going to allow that cool water that has a lot of nutrients to rise to the surface, okay? Now, if we look back, sorry, uh, if we look back here, <clears throat> The winds can go uh, parallel with the shore, the winds can also go from the shore away, right? But what you see here is almost like a half pipe. Um, if you're following along with my, with my tiny little arrow, um, you see a half pipe. And this is what is meant by the topography of the seabed. So the shape of the seabed or the large structures that are on the floor of the seabed will really help to funnel that water up towards the shore. Um, it works almost like a half pipe. Um, if you've ever seen the, the X Games, Extreme Games, or if you've ever seen uh, Sean White, um, Snowboard, anything like that, uh, you've seen them use a half pipe. And that's pretty much what these sea mounts, these ocean ridges, um, these underwater mounts create that that almost that half pipe type uh, movement or excuse me structure where the water can move up and be funneled towards the surface. Right? Now when there are incidences of upwelling and um, again we're, we're, let's specifically look at the uh, coast of South America. When you have these upwellings um, what is happening is that that warm surface layer of water that has already had the uh, nutrients all used up is being pushed away from the coastline. And this cool nutrient rich water is coming up to the surface. Well, that gives the producers all of the limiting nutrients it, they need to multiply. And this is a natural occurrence, right? So this is constantly happening. We have steady winds that push away uh, surface water from the coast of South America. Um, and they push that water towards Australia. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and really that's the, uh, that's the driving force behind a lot of fisheries down there. So these nutrients come up. The producers are able to produce. 
the herbivores are able to consume so they can then produce more of themselves um, and then the omnivores and the carnivores I mean it really just this this introduction of nutrients uh, helps with the productivity of all biomass not just your producers but also um, your consumers okay and this is a natural event that occurs constantly this isn't an event that's going to cause an algal bloom or anything or excuse me algal bloom or anything to that effect um, this is natural. This is what this is a normal, healthy ecosystem with high productivity based on your upleveling. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, why do we talk about that? We talk about that because, <coughs> excuse me, there are times where the trade winds um, don't necessarily come down to push the surface layer of the water away from the coast. Um, this happens in Chile and, and again in, in South America where <clears throat> it prevents the upwellings from occurring okay now during normal conditions like any year that's not considered an El Nino year during normal conditions um, usually the surface ocean water is very warm and because of that a lot of evaporation condensation occurs and you have a lot of, of storms and um, that end up brewing over the Pacific Ocean, but because of the winds, get pushed over to Australia. Now, that is a really good thing for Australia, and um, that brings fresh uh, fresh rain and, and water to an area that's experiencing drought, and it's also moving a lot of the surface water towards Australia, so it, this is a positive thing for Australia and, and um, Indonesia, right? Um, then this allows the upwelling to occur off the coast of South America, and so you know this is this is the normal, that is the normal process, right? So you've got storms from the warm water, you've got the winds pushing these storms over to Australia, and Australia experiencing um, periods of heavy rain that is helping to end the drought that they're in. Okay, during El Nino conditions, this occurs usually every three to five years. The surface temperature of the water will be 0.5 degrees higher than the mean surface temperature, which means just a change of half a degree. That small change um, usually is a result of weakened trade winds, right? So the winds that, as you see here up in the top right, the winds that would normally push um, water, surface water towards Australia Let's, um, let's pretend we are here and South America's here. This would push water that way around the globe, right? So you'd end up here where Australia is. Those trade winds are weak or weakened. And so the water that's on the surface cannot be pushed away, which means that that warm water just kind of piles up next to the surface, eliminating the upwelling. If it eliminates the upwelling, Productivity immediately slows, right? So you don't have that influx of nutrients coming in, so productivity is slowed, which means that many organisms die. Less food, less organisms, right? Um, it also means that these storms that would normally occur and be pushed to Australia now kind of stay right up there on, off of the coast of Chile, and they move north towards California, all right? And so really, um, this is this is a negative thing kind of all around. Uh, so like South America experiences heavy rainfall um, and a loss in fishery life or a loss of productivity. And then Australia continues to, Australia and Indonesia, excuse me, continue to suffer drought. So this is, this is a negative thing, and that's what El Nino is. It's really just a, a half a degree change in the surface uh, temperature of the water. These weakened trade winds um, not behaving as they normally would, um, causing a stop of upwellings on the coast, ruining productivity, and increasing the likelihood that there it would be heavy rain clouds in the area, and then um, causing Australia and Indonesia to continue through their dry seasons and suffer droughts, okay? All right, now let's move on to monsoons. 
I don't know if any of you have ever experienced, or no, excuse me, I don't know if any of you have ever seen a movie where a monsoon has occurred. Um, they usually are formed in, um, in the Indian Ocean, uh, on the Asian plate, um, and what they are are massive seasonally changing sea breeze circulations. So let's take a minute here and actually look at these drawings. So this is just a breeze, a sea breeze, and it's due to, that's right, convection currents, right? So now we see that term again. Um, so uh, convection currents, um, specifically here, are going to be related to the uneven heating of the surface of the uh, surface of the land versus the surface of the water. Right? And so there will be winds that change based on that uneven heating. Okay? Now, for a summer monsoon, so let's go right back to this picture. Top picture, you see it circling. All right. Okay, so for your summer monsoon, what's going to happen is your land is going to absorb the heat from the sun much faster than the actual ocean will. So if we look at the specific heat, um, the surface layer of the earth, the land, is going to reach that specific heat and then have to start radiating heat off of itself before the water will. The water is able to take in the heat and disperse it. Think of how many billions of gallons of water there are versus how much of that specific area of land there is. So if you, you take a look here, this can be the... The heat here can be absorbed and dispersed, whereas the heat here has nowhere to go but right here or right here, okay? Now, that creates a large temperature difference between the land and the water. As the land is heated, it heats the particles that are above it. Remember when we talked about your tides, you talk about the particles that are in the, um, the atmosphere and pushing down on the water, right? Same thing that happens over land. We have your particles in the atmosphere pushing down over the land. Um, and those, those particles get heated, right? And this will drag in hot, moist air that is adjacent to the coast. And that will cause the southwest wind that you see in that first picture. The water will condense into clouds over the land and then start to rain down in a torrential pour or downpour. That makes up 80% of the rainfall in the area for the year. Now let's go back to the picture. <clears throat> so basically what's happening here, this land is heating up really fast. The surface layer of the ocean is also heating up, right? So you have a lot of evaporation going on. So the, that warm, moist air will start to rise into the actual atmosphere. And it will be dragged over this hot land. The reason for that is all the particles here are basically gone because they are moving upwards. Now, why do I know that they're gone? Because they are being heated up and expanding. And as hot air rises, it drags in cooler, not cold, but cooler air up. So it's this constant circle of the air is cooled here, then it gets warm and it becomes moist because of the evaporation, gets dragged in, condenses, or continues in the cycle. And really that's, that's what's happening. It's just this constant shift up and down based on uh, heating and cooling events, okay? Now, the winter, it's the exact opposite. <clears throat> During the winter months, the, the water actually heats up faster than the land heats up. So you have the same event occurring, but over the ocean. So wherever the, uh, wherever the storms are occurring, they're occurring out in the open water as opposed to on land, okay? <clears throat> so again, your surface layer of your, of the, of the ocean will heat up much faster than this here, which will cause that dragging of air underneath it, the cooling over the land, and then the evaporation and condensation over here due to the heat. And then you will see storms, okay? Now again, this is a circular wind pattern. 
The resulting storms are because of the moist air that gets dragged into the equation because we're looking at the uneven heating surface of the land and the water. But what you're really looking at is just a simple circular wind pattern, right? So you have summer completely explained. Now winter, the ocean will hold more heat than the land. The warm air over the ocean rises, drags in that cool, dry air that was over the land. Uh, the wind is blowing northeast at this point, and it is a post-monsoon wind. So you have a monsoon wind and a post-monsoon wind. Uh, water will condense over the ocean and pour down. This causes a drought in the coastal areas that are attached. So if you look at this area, <clears throat> During the summer months, they are inundated with water. During the winter months, they are in drought. Okay, that's your monsoons. The final concept you're gonna learn about this year as we close the quarter in our homes by ourselves without each other, which is a sad situation for me, <clears throat> is tropical cyclones. Now, tropical cyclones are called Hurricanes here, and they are called typhoons in the West Pacific, okay? They are considered um, large, massive, low-pressure storms, um, and you should be quite familiar with hurricanes, okay? Now, how does a tropical cyclone form? This is a question that is very common for Cambridge. This is a question that I definitely will put on the test, all right? Tropical cyclones form over a large body of warm water. So it should be 26.9 degrees or so um, in, in heat or Celsius, right? 26.5 to 26.9 degrees Celsius. So these usually form near the equator. Near, not on the equator, but near the equator. Just north and just south of the equator, depending on your hemisphere, okay? As the air over the water is heated, it begins to rise. The rising air and water vapor create a low pressure area over the ocean. Remember when we talked about low pressure where the water is able to swell? Well, that's what's happening here during a hurricane. That low pressure area is usually referred to as the eye because that's the first area in which you start to see the, the um, traditional swelling from, <clears throat> from the low pressure. All right, the cooler air is going to be pulled in through that circular current. So over the water, you're gonna have a circular current, that I, that has low pressure. And that, that circular area is actually going to drag in warm, moist air or cool, moist air. It's gonna drag it into the uh, system, all right? The cool air is gonna be heated. It's going to collect evaporated water um, and then this movement of water and air starts to create that, that typical cyclical wind cell. And then the warm air and water will condense and start to release a lot of stored energy in the form of heat, which will then heat up the particles that are already in the storm or particles underneath the storm and continue that cycle of drawing in cooler, moist air, warming that air, uh, allowing that air to join with the circular currents of wind and so on, right? <clears throat> um, the cyclone will spin based on the Coriolis effect and gain energy through the convection current, right, of the cycling, cooling, or warming air. And then it will also gain a lot of energy um, just by staying over bodies of water. The moment that it moves off of the water, the system starts to deteriorate because it needs that low pressure, warm water to continue to move. Now, this is the exact answer. Um, the the uh, parentheses, right? That's just me being obnoxious and writing in the Coriolis effect or convection current or that's right near the equator. You don't need that part of it. What you need to write is that a tropical cyclone forms over a large body of, of warm water and then start to explain that as the air over the water is heated, it rises. That rising air and water vapor creates the low pressure that low pressure area is referred to as the eye. This is where the cooler air is being pulled into the current. The cool air is heated, it collects evaporated water, it begins to spin, creates winds. The warm air and water condense and release 
stored energy in the form of heat, right? Latent heat. This heat, along with the heat from the sun, helps to heat even larger amounts of air and water, right? So it's a cycle that it's a it's a cycle that continuously fuels the system. There are so many points where everything is being heated specifically because of the energy that it creates, okay? Now, what are some of the features of a tropical cyclone? And you want to know the features of a tropical cyclone. You have storms. You have um, strong winds. You have low pressure. Um, eye. You have an eye, right? Um, you have these typical circular spin of it. Now, that's not written here. But that's, an, that's a question and an answer, a Cambridge question and answer. So you want to know what those features of the tropical cyclone are. And how do they impact the coast? Well, the winds and rain can be incredibly destructive. Um, they are also considered very dangerous, right? Think about um, Hurricane Katrina. You saw a, a lot of death, not just a uh, death of the land, but human life was taken, uh, animal life was taken. So it causes a lot of death. It can be very dangerous, very destructive. Um, it also destroys properties. It erodes the shoreline. It damages anchored boats. It damages regular boats. Storm surges cause flooding. Again, increasing the amount that properties will be dam damaged, increasing the idea that, or the amount of people that could be affected or killed by flooding, okay? With all this destruction comes some positive, right? Ecologically, the storms replenish water to an area which is dry or arid, so it's bringing in fresh water from the rains, right? Not the salt water that you're thinking of, but the rains will bring in a lot of fresh water and um, rehydrate dry areas. It also brings in nutrients to those areas, okay? These storms, the wave action from these storms, also erode coastal reefs and damage properties and shorelines. So there are positive and negatives, mostly negatives, but there are some positives um, to tropical cyclones um, impacting coastal communities. That is it. You are done with chapter seven and you are done with the Cambridge curriculum for this year. So the rest of the time, all you're going to see is review. We're going to review until we get to that test and we're getting to that test. Um, and hopefully we'll be up and ready to go by the time we get there, okay? Um, again, I hate doing this online. I miss your faces. Uh, you guys are really important to me. So I'm sorry it had to be online, but I'm glad that you're getting the instruction.